The title of today's lecture is Stable Carbon Isotopes, Tools for Detection of the Origin and Fate of Environmental Contaminants. A lecture such as today has, of course, benefited enormously from contributions from numerous collaborators and colleagues. However, right at the beginning, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the very important role played by the graduate students of the University of Toronto in this research. In particular, Helen Dempster, Greg Slater, Neil Arner, Jason Ahad, and Hong Lee. In the course of today's lecture, I'll be covering First, some of the research that was carried out in this area using conventional techniques of mass spectrometry and sample handling. But you'll find that most of the research will be emphasizing the development of a new type of technology, and that is referred to as compound specific or continuous flow, GCC IRMS. And it is really this technology that has sparked a revolution in our ability to apply stable carbon isotopes in both environmental geochemistry and contaminant hydrogeology. For, of course, stable carbon isotopes have been used for some time in environmental geochemistry. For carbon-bearing compounds, there are two stable isotopes of carbon, carbon-12 and carbon-13. And isotopic analysis involves measurement of the C13 to C12 ratio to establish a delta C13 signature, where the signature is simply defined as the C13 to C12 ratio in a given sample measured with respect to an established international standard. We have found that stable carbon isotopes provides us with two basic types of information. The first is information about source, because different compounds retain different distinct isotopic signatures indicative of their source or origin. The second type of information can be information about processes. Different subsurface processes, such as volatilization or biodegradation, can fractionate or alter delta C13 signatures in characteristic and recognizable ways. If these patterns of isotopic fractionation can be recognized for a given compound, then the isotopic signatures may provide us with information about what types of processes are acting on that compound. So whether it's information about source or information about processes then, stable carbon isotopes provide us with important tools for examining the origin or the fate of dissolved organic contaminants. The focus of today's lecture will be two particular groups of priority pollutants, and those are the aromatic hydrocarbons, or BTEX group of compounds, benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and the xylenes, and the second group of compounds are the chlorinated hydrocarbons, such as PCE, TCE, etc. And the important point to note here is that these contaminants are present at groundwater at very low concentrations, PPM, PPB level concentrations. At these types of low levels, it was simply not possible to routinely apply stable carbon isotope analysis using conventional techniques of mass spectrometry and sample handling. So once again, it was really this very recent development of compound specific isotopic analysis that has allowed us for the first time to apply stable carbon isotopes to study of the origin and the fate of these groups of compounds at the types of concentrations at which we find them in groundwater in the field. As I mentioned, however, first I'll start off and give you some background on what types of approaches were taken earlier in this research history using more conventional methods of mass spectrometry and sample handling. These types of applications or approaches tended to come down to one of two basic groups. The first is measurement of the delta C13 signature of CO2 or dissolved inorganic carbon to try and obtain evidence of biodegradation of contaminants. Whereas this technique has had a couple of uh, very um, successful applications at a number of sites, nonetheless for a variety of reasons, which there is not time in the scope of today's lecture to cover in detail, this technique has fallen far short of being the definitive tracer of biodegradation that we might perhaps once have hoped it would be. So instead, I'll focus a little bit more on the second approach, which is isotopic characterization of the free product, or pure phase organic solvent, from different sources and manufacturers. And of course, the, um, the idea here is to try and see whether we can use isotopes to identify differences between sources of contamination at a site where we may know or suspect that there is more than one potential source contributing to the overall contamination. 
The first work done taking this approach was carried out by Liz Van Warmedam working at the University of Waterloo in 1995. And what Liz did was to obtain aliquots of this free product or pure organic solvent for TCE from three different manufacturers. And I plot here as well results in orange from the University of Toronto. The delta C13 signature is on the Y axis. The take home point from this slide is a very simple one, but a very important one. What it shows us is that indeed there are distinct differences in delta C13 signature for free product coming from different sources or manufacturers. So the potential is there to use stable carbon isotopes to distinguish between these various sources of contamination. Taking a similar approach, but working at the University of Toronto, Helen Dempster obtained aliquots of free product of the BTEX group of compounds, benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and the isomers of xylene, again from three different manufacturers. The take home point is a simple one once more. What she found is the delta C13 signature of benzene, for instance, toluene, ethylbenzene, etc., are isotopically different for different sources of these compounds. What's important as well is that the overall pattern of isotopic variation, or what we might refer to as the isotopic fingerprint, is also different for the different manufacturers. Specifically, as you can see here, for manufacturers three and manufacturer two, we have approximately a linear variation within the first three compounds in this group. In contrast, manufacturer one is quite distinct, showing a trend of increasing depletion in delta C13 signature as you go from benzene to toluene to ethylbenzene. As well, as you can see, there are distinct differences in the latter parts of this um, figure. Specifically, whereas all three manufacturers show an enrichment trend after ethylbenzene, followed by a trend of depletion within the isomers of xylene, once again, there are distinct differences between different manufacturers. For manufacturers one and two, the most enriched compound in the entire group of six compounds is paraxylene. In contrast, manufacturer three is quite distinct. The most enriched compound for um, this BTEX group of compounds from this manufacturer is metaxylene. What this information tells you, though, is that the potential is there to use these types of changes in isotopic signature from different manufacturers to try and identify different source end members. There's one important caveat. We're not meaning to imply by this information that a given manufacturer will have a single delta C13 number, minus 26 per mil, for instance, for benzene, at all of its sites over the last 30 years. This is not likely to be the case, particularly as source materials and manufacturing processes change. The potential that is here is for a much more site-specific or case-specific approach than that. If you have a site where you know or suspect that there may be more than one potential contributor to the overall contamination, what this information tells you is that you may be able to use delta C13 signatures to identify those different source end members and to quantitatively resolve their relative contribution to the overall contamination. The conclusion for this part of the talk then is that there is indeed potential to use stable carbon isotopes for site-specific source differentiation. However, there's another assumption implicit in that statement, and that is that this potential is there where isotopic signatures are conservative. In other words, where the compounds retain the distinct isotopic signatures indicative of their source or origin. As I mentioned in the, in the introduction, many subsurface processes have the potential to change or fractionate the isotopic composition of a compound and make it behave in a non-conservative way. And if that takes place, then we begin to lo lose the potential for source differentiation. So it's specifically this issue of determining whether or not the isotopic composition of a given compound is conservative or non-conservative in the subsurface that will be the focus of the rest of today's lecture. As I mentioned, all of the work that I've showed you so far could have been carried out using conventional methods of mass spectrometry and sample handling that's been available to, uh, to us for decades. And that's primarily because if you're taking a look at free product or pure solvent phase, you have no sample size limitation. The real challenge to advancing this field of research was the development of isotope techniques that were sensitive enough to be able to measure these types of dissolved organic contaminants at the types of very low concentrations at which they are present in groundwater. In other words, at the PPM to PPB levels at which these 
contaminants routinely appear in the field. And the key to that, of course, was the development of this new technology referred to as compound specific or continuous flow technology, or more specifically as GCC IRMS. Essentially, the system involves a direct interface between a gas chromatograph, a microcombustion system, and an isotope ratio mass spectrometer. There are four primary advantages to GCC IRMS. The first is simply efficiency and cost effectiveness. Analysis that previously would take up to an entire day to get one number can now be completed in anywhere between 5 and 20 minutes, depending on the compound of interest. Most importantly, however, what this provides is increased sensitivity by four to five orders of magnitude, essentially lowering sample requirements to the picomole to nanomole level. This not only allows us to collect less sample for analysis, allowing us to do this work on milliliters of water rather than several liters, but more importantly, it is allowing us to do isotopic analysis at much higher resolution, spatial and temporal scales than ever before possible. And so therefore, this is why I say that it is the development of this GCC IRMS technology that's really been the key to allowing us to routinely apply stable carbon isotope analysis to these two types of priority pollutants, the BTEX group of compounds and the chlorinated hydrocarbons that are present in groundwater at PPB, PPM level concentrations. Having provided you with an overview then of the analytical and technical framework for this work, in the rest of the uh, presentation, what I'll be doing is focusing on the applications that GCC IRMS have made possible. So we'll be looking at both source fingerprinting applications and at applications to find out information about processes, such as, for instance, degradation and attenuation of contaminants. But once again, the key question here really is determining whether or not the delta C13 signatures of a given compound remain conservative or are non-conservative and fractionated by subsurface processes. And to do that, what I'd like to do first is step back a bit and review a little bit about the principles of isotopic fractionation. In order to do that, I have first gone to some of the very earliest experiments carried out in isotope geochemistry. And these were carried out to take a look at the isotopic fractionation involved in a simple phase change as water vapor formed over top of liquid water by evaporation. And I've done this example simply from the perspective of the two main stable isotopes of oxygen, O16 shown in green and O18 shown in orange. Essentially what we find here is, is as water vapor forms over top of liquid water, we see preferential incorporation of the light or C12 laden water molecules into the vapor phase. And this is simply due to the fact that the vapor pressure of these isotopically laden molecules is inversely proportional to their mass. The net result then is a vapor phase that becomes relatively enriched in the light isotopes compared to the water phase from which it formed. The remaining water then, or the residual, becomes depleted in the light isotope, gaining a more and more positive isotopic signature. So that's fractionation that takes place during something like a phase change. Perhaps more intuitively, we tend to think as fraction of fractionation as something taking place during an actual reaction, where we have breakage of bonds, for instance. And to illustrate that, I have again chosen a classic example from the literature, which is fractionation that takes place during biodegradation or microbial oxidation of methane. Before biodegradation, if you envisage this schematic as either a pool of methane gas or a plume of dissolved methane, the delta C13 signature of that methane, once again, is simply the C13 to C12 ratio of that pool. During the course of degradation, what we see is preferential degradation of the light, in this case C12 laden molecules, into the breakdown product. So preferential removal of the light isotopes into the breakdown products. After degradation has been taking place for some time then, the net result on the residual methane pool is that it becomes progressively isotopically enriched in the heavy isotope, C13. In other words, it gains a more and more positive delta C13 signature. And this has been known for some time and used to classically identify a methane plume that has undergone a process of biodegradation. The question we asked ourselves then is, now that we have the technology available to allow us to apply isotopes 
Two, some of these dissolved organic contaminants at the types of concentrations at which they are realistically found in the field in groundwater. If we take a look at isotopic um, fractionations involved in degradation reactions for these compounds, will we find that biodegradation, for instance, is isotopically fractionating for these compounds in a manner analogous to what we saw for methane? And more specifically, will we see this same type of preferential incorporation of the light or carbon-12 isotope into the breakdown products? As I mentioned in the tr introduction, different reaction pathways or mechanisms can have different characteristic fractionation patterns associated with them. If these characteristic fractionation patterns can be identified then, delta C13 signatures have the potential, for instance, to help us distinguish between different possible reaction pathways. In addition, they may help us indicate or monitor the extent of degradation that's taking place for these contaminants. In particular, it occurred to us that isotopes may provide us with evidence for processes such as natural attenuation or more specifically, intrinsic bioremediation. Intrinsic bioremediation, of course, is one of the most important topics in contaminant hydrogeology right now. The suggestion has been made recently that at some sites, in fact, the most efficient and cost-effective means of cleaning up contamination may be to rely on the action of microorganisms in situ under natural conditions. The two problems, though, are how does one prove that intrinsic bioremediation is actually taking place? And secondly, how does one prove that it is taking place at rates that are fast enough to actually deal with the contamination. It occurred to us that if we can see isotopic fractionation signals associated with biodegradation, then isotopes may provide us with a new tool for providing direct evidence of whether or not intrinsic bioremediation is actually taking place. In the rest of this talk, then, I'll be focusing primarily on this issue of degradation. However, I first want to take a step back and provide you with a very quick overview of, in fact, where about the first year's worth of research results took us. Essentially, there's no point in going out into the field and taking a look at isotopic variation and trying to interpret it simply in the context of degradation processes if one has not first also taken a very careful look at the types of isotopic fractionation or changes that may be produced by the other major subsurface processes acting on these contaminants. In particular, of course, the first means of contaminant dispersal in these environments is obviously dissolution and volatilization. So the first phase of our research was to undertake a very careful period of laboratory and field experiments designed to take a look at the isotopic fractionation effects associated with dissolution, volatilization, and adsorption. Most of this work has been published, so I will not be covering it in detail today. I'll simply give you the underlying conclusion. And the conclusion to all of this work was that at equilibrium within 0.5 per mil, which is the standard accuracy and reproducibility for GCC IRMS analysis, we find that all of these major processes are isotopically conservative. In other words, they introduce no isotopic fractionation to the compounds that we want to look at. So for the rest of this talk, then, I'll be focusing primarily on this issue of degradation and taking a look at processes of both abiotic and biotic degradation. The primary objectives of this phase of the research were to determine, first of all, are delta C13 signatures conservative or non-conservative during contaminant degradation? And secondly, if they are non-conservative, are the fractionation patterns reproducible? such that they can be used as potential tracers of the nature and extent of contaminant degradation. The first work that I'll cover for you today concerns our experiments looking at abiotic dechlorination of chlorinated hydrocarbons. Essentially, abiotic dechlorination is a surface redox reaction involving reduction of the organic compound and corrosion of the metal. This particular process takes place in natural groundwaters, even if they are very anaerobic, only at vanishingly small rates. However, in a key paper published in 1994, Gillam and O'Hanison showed that if chlorinated hydrocarbons are put in the presence of large amounts of zero-valent metals, such as zero-valent iron, that rates 5 to 15 orders of magnitude more effective than natural rates can be achieved. And that brought this process of abiotic dechlorination right up into the realm of something that could be reasonably used as a remediation scheme. And in fact, 
A number of these remediation schemes have already been put in place worldwide, referred to as iron walls. I have chosen to highlight this one from O'Hanison and Gillum in a paper in press in groundwater, primarily because uh, this particular installation is the one for which we have the longest record or track history. Essentially, they have a source and then down gradient of that source, a dissolved plume. The dissolved plume is passing through a permeable iron wall of 1.6 meters in diameter. And this wall consists of 22% granular iron and 78% porous media. As the plume passes across the wall, the contaminants undergo abiotic dechlorination. What they found in taking a look at mass reduction is that even with a plume with concentrations of greater than 200 milligrams per liter TCE up gradient of the wall and greater than 50 milligrams per liter PCE, they obtained percentages of mass reduction between 85 and 90 percent as the plume passed across the wall. And this type of performance was maintained for a period of several years. I believe five years was the total duration of this test. Given what would appear to be then quite a success story in terms of use of these types of iron walls for remediation, if one takes a look at the literature, it's interesting to see the number of very active areas of research that are taking place in order to help us better understand what is actually going on in these type of abiotic dechlorination systems. In one slide, I've tried to very briefly summarize the state of the research that's related to abiotic dechlorination. In particular, one of the areas that's receiving a lot of research is an attempt to identify the precise dechlorination pathway or reaction mechanism by which this process takes place. Given that there is uncertainty about the actual reaction mechanism then, not surprisingly, a lot of research is going into trying to identify the nature and the extent of the breakdown products and intermediates. And this is a key issue because the um, breakdown products for many of these compounds are themselves toxic contaminants, in particular things like vinyl chloride. So in fact, the ultimate determination of the performance and design criteria for these iron wall systems must include not only the amount of mass reduction of the primary contaminant, but what happens to the breakdown products and the intermediates. A lot of research is going on looking at sorption and reduction kinetics for these surface-driven reactions, and of course then taking a look at carbon mass balance and performance and design criteria. Once again, the angle that we took on this is that we could use stable isotopes and determine whether or not there are fractionation patterns associated with abiotic dechlorination then stable isotopes might provide us with a new tool that would allow us to try and tackle some of these other research problems. Again, the first work that we did was a laboratory phase where we set up a series of batch vial experiments, putting aqueous solutions of TCE in, con in contact with, in this case, zero valent iron. And what we looked at then is the delta C13 signature of that residual TCE as it underwent progressive degradation. In addition, on this next slide, you'll see a little bit of preliminary characterization of some of the breakdown products for this reaction, in this case in particular, DCE. The results from this first phase of the experiment are shown on this slide with delta C13 signature of the residual TCE on the y-axis and with time on the x-axis. So increasing time gives us increasing amount of degradation. There's a number of important take-home points from this slide, and the first is simply that abiotic dechlorination is indeed non-conservative. And in fact, that we see not only fractionation factors, but very large fractionation factors, up to 40 per mil. So you see the delta C13 signature of the TCE starts out at minus 31 per mil. At more than 90% degradation, we've got a value of plus 10 per mil, a 40 per mil change in the isotopic signature of the TCE over the course of degradation. Another important point is if one looks at the delta C13 signature of the breakdown product, you see that the delta C13 signature of the T DCE is always more negative than the TCE with which it is associated. This seems to confirm this idea that we'll get preferential break, uh, transformation of the light or C12 laden molecules into the breakdown products. And indeed, as we saw for methane, we see a classic enrichment trend if we take a look at the residual TCE. In other words, the delta C13 signature of that TCE becomes more and more positive over the course of degradation. Again, reflecting as it did for methane, that preferential incorporation of carbon-12 
into the breakdown products. The last point I'd like to draw your attention to is that this behavior is highly reproducible. The results that you're seeing here are actually for a duplicate set of experiments. At each particular sampling point, we're in fact measuring not one vial, but two experimental vials independently degrading. And in all but one case, where you can actually see here two different numbers for those vials, in all other cases, the two numbers for the duplicate sets of vials are right on top of each other. So you can't actually see that what you're looking at are duplicate experiments with highly reproducible behavior. The goal of the rest of our experiments was to try and examine exactly how reproducible these fractionation patterns are, and what, if any, are controlling these fractionations. The ultimate goal was to develop a quantitative database that would allow us to start to try and model these systems. And in particular, to see how close, for instance, something like a Raleigh distillation model could come to explaining these results. Raleigh distillation models are some of the simplest and most fundamental of isotopic models, so they're always a good place to start when you want to start um, trying to quantitatively describe these systems. The next phase of the experimentation, then, is shown here on this slide. Again, we are looking at uh, exactly the same experimental protocol, a series of batch filed experiments with zero valent iron, where the delta C13 signature of the residual CCE is shown on the y-axis. And in this case, what we've uh, plotted on the x-axis is the fraction of TCE remaining. So we're starting out with 100% of the TCE, and as it undergoes degradation, increasing degradation is moving this way down the x-axis. Again, exactly the same experimental protocol. We have simply varied one factor, and that is the reaction rate. So what you're looking at here, then, are the results for six sets of vials, two duplicate vials degrading at an initial rate, two duplicate vials degrading at twice that rate, and two duplicate sets of vials degrading at four times the reaction rate. And we varied the reaction rate simply by varying the iron to water ratio in the vials. There are a couple of important take home points from this slide. The first is that the fractionation patterns do not seem to be a function of the rate of the reaction. Instead, what we see for all of the vials is a very highly reproducible correlation between the delta C13 signature of the TCE and the extent to which that TCE is degraded. Particularly in the later stages of the experiments, all of the vials can indeed be modeled by a simple Raleigh closed system set of equations, and all of the data fall along a single Raleigh curve. What this means then is that all of the data can be described by the same fractionation factor or enrichment factor of about 15 to 16. We have since redone these experiments varying a number of different factors. We have uh, undertaken these experiments under dynamic conditions. The experiments that I've shown you are, of course, static. They're done in batch files. We have redone these experiments using column experiments. We have redone them with real site simulations using actual porous media and contaminated groundwater from a site. In addition, we have taken a look at fractionation factors for different types of iron. In particular, there are two typical commercial grades of iron used in these remediation schemes and we've done these experiments using both types of iron. The main point is that the fractionation patterns we see are highly reproducible regardless of any of these variations that we've done in the experiments. In other words, in all of these experiments, we have found the same excellent correlation between the delta C13 signature of the residual TCE and the extent to which that TCE is degraded. In order to try and explore this a little bit further, we did decide to take a look at one further type of iron, and that is electrolytic iron. Now, electrolytic iron is a fairly expensive laboratory grade of iron. It's never going to be used in a remediation scheme. However, it has a number of properties that make it different from commercial grades of iron. And we were very interested to see whether abiotic dechlorination on these, this type of iron with very different properties would indeed show us a difference in the fractionation pattern. Once again, the results that you see here were carried out by the same type of experimental protocol. Once again, you're seeing results for a duplicate set of experiments, so therefore we've got a good degree of reproducibility.